Welcome to the Daily Office Lectionary. I'm Father Reed. Today we're going to look at scriptures from Proper 4. Proper 4. Now if you look at the scriptures in this post, we have three separate categories. We have the Old Testament with Ecclesiastes. That's an interesting book. Ecclesiastes. Then we have Galatians. Paul's letter to the Galatians. And then we have our continuing study of Christ in Matthew. Okay? Matthew's Gospel in proper four. Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes follows Proverbs. We looked at Proverbs the last couple of weeks, the last couple of uh, programs, and so we are in Ecclesiastes. Find that in your Bible. It might not be a book that you are very familiar with, but it has some very interesting uh, theology behind it and some interesting reading. So listen closely. Chapter 1. The words of the teacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. This is from Solomon. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What does man gain from all his labor at which he toils under the sun? What is the point of it all? What's the point of all this? What's the point of our existence? What has been will be again, verse 9. What has been done will be done again. There's nothing new under the sun. You've heard that phrase before? Is there anything of which someone could say, look, there's something new. It was already here already long ago. It was here before our time. There's nothing new under the sun. It's all been done before. Continuing on. Chapter 2. I thought in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But that also proved to be meaningless. So he's talking about what is important in life. What are we here for? What are we trying to achieve? What's the point of our existence? And he concludes that life is meaningless. Look at verse 11 of chapter 2. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. Then I turned my thoughts to consider wisdom and also madness and folly. What more can the king's successor do than what has already been done? I saw that wisdom is better than folly, just as light is better than darkness. The wise man has eyes in his head while the fool walks in the darkness. That sounds very much like Proverbs, doesn't it? Chapter 3. You've heard this verse before. There's a time for everything. There's a season for every activity under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to uproot. A time to kill, a time to heal, a time to tear down, a time to build. Verse 7. A time to tear, a time to mend, a time to be silent, a time to speak, a time to love, a time to hate, a time for war, a time for peace. What does the worker gain from his toil? Verse 10. I have seen the burden that God has laid on men. He's made everything beautiful in his time. He's also set eternity in the hearts of man. That's a very important scripture. Yet they cannot fathom what God has done for them from beginning to end. People cannot understand what God has done. They can't contemplate it. I know that there's something better for men than to be happy and do good while they live. That every man should eat and drink and find satisfaction in all his toil. This is a gift from God. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing can be taken from it. God does it so that men will reveal him. Revere him, I'm sorry. Revere him. I thought in my heart, verse 17 of Ecclesiastes 3, it's not in the text, but I'm going to read it anyway. God will bring to judgment both the righteous and the wicked, for there will be a time for every activity, a time for every deed. Everything that you and I do is important. What's the important thing? That we revere the Lord, that we look first to the Lord. As I said in last time from Proverbs, that we submit to the Lord, that we do what the Lord says. That is wisdom. The rest of it is meaningless. 3.16 to 4.3. All come from dust, verse 20, and to dust all return. Ash Wednesday. We're dust. Cremation. To dust we shall return. Chapter 5. 
Do not be quick with your mouth, verse 2. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven, and you are on the earth. Let your words be few. Watch what you say. Watch what you say to God. Be careful. Do not misspeak. Verse 4, chapter 6, chapter, um, chapter 5, verse 4. When you make a vow to God, do not delay in fulfilling it. He has no pleasure in fools fulfill your vow. It is better not to vow than make a vow and not fulfill it. Stand in awe of God, verse 7. Stand in awe of God. Whoever loves money never has enough. Boy, that's true, isn't it? Chapter 5, verse uh, 10. Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. income. This too is meaningless. So what's important? So what's important? Naked, a man comes from his mother's womb. And as he comes, verse 15, so he departs. He takes nothing from his labor that he can carry in his hand. You can't take anything with you. So what have you got? In the end, you've either got a relationship with God Almighty or you don't. And if you don't, it's meaningless. And if you do, it's eternal because your relationship with God is the most important thing you possess. Ecclesiastes is a wonderful book. Read it closely. I just wanted to share a couple of verses with you and encourage you to enjoy this amazing book. Another amazing book is the book of Galatians. Now, Galatians is one of those books that's it's pretty tough, meaning... The Galatians were people from Galatia that were evangelized by Paul and they made quite a few mistakes and he is chastising them most severely. So listen closely to these words and enjoy your reading when you read the Daily Lectionary. Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father. So God's the one that sent him, who raised him from the dead. Grace and peace to you, chapter 1, verse 3, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of God our Father, to him be glory forever and ever. He says, verse 6, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and turning to a different gospel which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion, verse 7, and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. Now, what Paul is presenting in, to the Galatians and throughout his ministry, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Corinthians, Romans, is the gospel of Christ. And he says in verse 8, if we or any angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one that we preached to you, let him be eternally condemned. The Greek word there is anathema. You may know that word. Eternally condemned. As we've already said, now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel other than the one that you accepted, let him be eternally condemned. Why do you not believe the gospel I've shared with you? Why are you going away? Why are you moving away from it? Is the gist of what Galatians is about. He says in verse 10, am I trying to win the approval of men or God? Am I trying to please men? If I were trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. We're not in the people people pleasing business, folks. We are here to present the the gospel. As we uh, looked at last time, we looked in the last program at 1 John and 2 and 3 John about loving one another and loving the commands of God. And we noticed in Loving God, this was two uh, sessions ago in Proper 2, that loving God and loving one another was crucial. Paul is certainly a man of love here in the scriptures in Proper 4, but he is not going to abdicate the truth. He is not going to give in to the truth. He is going to preach the gospel. So we need to remember when John, 1 John talked about love, about truth. Okay? So we need to believe what is true. We are to love the truth. They have abdicated the truth. I want you to know, brothers, in verse 11, that the gospel I preach is not something that man made up. I did not receive it from man, 
nor was I taught it. I received it by the revelation from Jesus Christ. And they have responded in a negative way to the gospel. So you ask yourself, what would Paul say to people that have abandoned the gospel? The answer, read Galatians. Read Galatians. Verse 15 of chapter 1. But when God, who set me apart from birth and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his Son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not consult anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was. I immediately went into Arabia and returned to Damascus. And then he tells them about his journeys. We go through chapter 2. Paul opposes Peter, the great Peter. He opposes Peter to his face. We, verse 15 of chapter 2, who are Jews by birth, birth and not Gentile sinners, know that a person is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Christ. That's how you get saved, by faith in Christ, not by obeying the law, because no one can obey the law. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in right standing before God by faith in Christ and not by observing the law because by observing the law, no one will be justified. Why? Because no one can keep the law. No one can keep the, full, the Ten Commandments fully. We can't keep the law of God. The law is very important. I'm not abrogating the law of God. There's a better way now and that is our faith in Christ. So the, the Galatians were going back to the law and negating Christ, negating the gospel message, moving in a different direction, which, as Paul would say, is no direction at all. Verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I did not set aside the grace of God for his righteousness could be gained through the law, then Christ died for nothing. If we could be righteous by observing the law, why'd the man die on the cross? It doesn't make any sense. The reason he died on the cross and repentance is required and faith in him in order to be saved is because of our sin, we have separated ourselves from God and if we continue in our sin without the blood of Jesus covering our sin, we will be eternally condemned. The gospel message is about Christ. If we lose that message, if we rebel against that message, if we say no to that message, as these folks have done, then how can we be saved? And Paul wants them to be saved. Chapter 3. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Verse 1. Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law, believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning with the Spirit, are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? You can't do this by yourself. There's no way you could keep the law. Why are you advocating your relationship with Christ? Why are you turning to a different gospel? He says later on, in uh, verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse from us, by hanging on the tree, the cross. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on the tree. This is from um, Deuteronomy 21, 33. Jesus redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham, remember Abraham in Genesis, might come to the Gentiles, those are nine Jews, through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. We do this by faith. We do this by faith in the Son of God, not by observing the law. By observing the law, no one will be justified, as I just read. Chapter 3, the second half. Scripture declares, verse 22, that the whole world is a prisoner of sin. No doubt about it. So that what was promised being given through faith in Christ, always by faith in Christ, faith in Christ, faith in Christ, might be given to those who believe might be given to those who believed. You are sons of God through faith in Christ. You are daughters of God by faith in Christ Jesus, verse 26 of chapter 3. And finally, in the first part of chapter 4, because, verse 6, you are sons and daughters of God, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, the Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. And so it's an intimate relationship with God. The Spirit of God leads us into that intimate relationship with God. So you are no longer a slave, 
but you're a son. Since you are a son, God has made you an heir. This is the great news of the gospel. By our repentance and faith in Christ and following Christ, we are saved unto eternal life. We are no longer slaves. We are sons and daughters of God. Since we are a son or daughter of God, God has made us an heir. We now are righteous before God by our faith in Christ. Now, if we want to go down the same pathway, according to the law, it's impossible, Paul says. Do not go down that path. Matthew chapter 13, back to Matthew. Much to think about in Galatians and certainly a lot to think about in Ecclesiastes, two great um, books of the Bible. Matthew 13, 44, one of my favorite verses in the Bible. The kingdom of heaven. What is the kingdom of heaven like? Treasure hidden in a field. When a person finds it, they hide it. And in their joy, went and sold all he had, all she had, and bought that field. The value of the kingdom of God is so great that you would sell everything you have and buy it so that you can have it. Nothing is more valuable. Remember when I past programs, I talked about the importance of Proverbs and wisdom and knowing what God wants you to do greater than choice, gold and silver, rubies, nothing's more valuable. The kingdom of heaven, verse 45, is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he finds one of great value, he goes away and sells everything he has and buys it. The kingdom of heaven is worth more value than anything that you can possibly possess. Though you may have lots of money in the bank, it is meaningless compared to the kingdom of God and the value of the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus tells us is important. From Matthew 13. He goes from there and talks about the parable of the net. And then he talks about a prophet without honor. They said, isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? Aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, Judas? Aren't, aren't all of his sisters with us? Who is this person? Where did this man get all these things? They took offense at him, scandal on. Jesus said, only in his hometown, in his own house, is a prophet without honor. And he did not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. That is not something you and I want to do, brothers and sisters, is have a lack of faith in Christ. It has great consequences. John the Baptist is beheaded. A terrifying story. Verses 1 through 12. The head of John the Baptist on a platter. Jesus feeds the 5,000 in 13 to 21. This is 5,000 men, women and children were not counted. Probably 15 to 20,000 people. What does he feed them with? Uh, five loaves and two fish. The bread was very small. The fish were very small. How does he do that? He's a miracle worker. He's able to replicate extraordinary amounts of food. This is a tremendous miracle. He feeds them. He breaks the loaves. He gives it to the disciples. The disciples give it to the people. They ate and were satisfied, verse 20. And the disciples picked up 12, remember the number 12, 12 tribes of Israel, Back, basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. 5,000 men, besides women and children. 15,000, guess? Women and children, another five for each, assuming you have one child. An extraordinary miracle. Oh, let's go to the next miracle. How about walking on water? How about walking on water? Anybody can do that? Take courage to desire, do not be afraid. And then Peter says, tell me to come walk on the water, and he does. But then his eyes turn off Jesus, and he begins to drown. Jesus reaches out his hand and rescues him. A fantastic teaching. And then finally, the clean and the unclean. Verse 8. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship, they worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. I'm not interested in rules taught by men. I'm not interested in what somebody says. What does your heart say? Where are you in relationship to God with your heart? Are you listening to the precepts of God, the commands of God? As we saw in 1 John, for example or as we saw in Proverbs, or as we see the meaningless of trying to do it your own way in Ecclesiastes, or the foolishness of another gospel in Galatians. 
Every plant that my father has not planted will be pulled up by the roots. Verse 13, leave them. They're blind gods. If a blind man leads a blind man, they'll both fall into the pit. Jesus said in verse 18 of chapter 15, the things that come out of the mouth come from the heart and these make us unclean. I am not interested in what you are eating I am very much interested is what's coming out of your mouth because that tells me about your heart and it tells me whether you are wicked or you are clean. That's what I'm concerned about, Jesus says. This is why the reading of the scripture is so important, brothers and sisters. We hear what God is saying. We read what he's saying. He tells us what he wants us to believe, what he wants us to know, and how we are to live our lives. So we have these great three books Ecclesiastes, Galatians, and Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew. God bless you. Enjoy your reading. Enjoy your prayer time. Listen to the Holy Spirit speak to you as he shares with you the truths contained therein. See you next time as we continue to read, study, and live out the Holy Scriptures. God bless you.